G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy today doing a uh, trade period wrap video. Obviously I did a few videos um, throughout the trade period and then I sort of held fire for the last three days. And then I kind of got sick again for the second time in two weeks, uh, which is just great. So um, a bit of a delayed reaction and uh, today's video I'm going to be talking about the teams that I think won and lost throughout the trade period. I thought of a few ways to do this video. Do I go through each team individually? Do I rank them? Uh, but in the end I decided to just isolate some teams that I think either won or lost uh, and then talk about some teams where it's probably not so clear exactly how they went in this year's trade period. So the basic format for the video will be I'll go through four teams that I think were genuine winners in this trade period. Then I'll go through four teams that I think uh, were probably on the losing end, of which there were definitely uh, a few. And then there's three teams that I also want to talk about because there was a plenty of action going on, but it's unclear exactly how they did and may be unclear for a few years yet to come. So on the whole, that's 11 teams of the league that I'm going to be talking about. There was plenty of action, uh, hence talking about 11 teams that means there's seven teams where I thought probably isn't worth really deep diving what they did in the trade period uh, a little bit vanilla uh, and that's okay but it means I'm going to be talking about 11 teams in this video as always guys we are sponsored by manscape.com for all your male grooming needs you can go to their website and use the code truefooty20 to get 20% off and free shipping on their products. Summer's just around the corner. It's time to uh, start getting yourselves in shape. And also, you know, do the finishing touches, uh, you know, whether it be chest shaving or, you know, ball deodorants, shampoos, conditioners, everything you need. 20% off and free shipping with the code TRUEFOOTY20. But anyway, let's crack straight into the video. This, uh, the theme of this trade period really was that it was a case of the, the strong teams getting stronger and uh, the poor teams, so to speak, getting absolutely pillaged, but we'll go through all of that. I'm gonna start off with, uh, this video is in no particular order, but I'm gonna start off with a team that probably did the better than arguably any team in any trade period ever, and that is our reigning premiers, the Geelong Footy Club. <laughs> Footy Club. They brought in Jack Bowes, Tanner Braun, Ollie Henry, and pick seven. Much has been said about their trade period so far. Uh, they lost Cooper Stevens and a series of picks, their pick 18 this year, and a couple of later picks, 38, 48, and 55. They've given away their second round pick next year and their third and fourth round. We'll talk about the most lopsided deal in history already. Much has been said, including on this channel, about Jack Bowes and pick seven going from the Gold Coast Suns to Geelong for a future third round pick. And this is just the most bizarre trade you will arguably ever see unless Gold Coast decide to wind up themselves next year. It seems like they, they keep pushing the bar for what is a ridiculous deal, but how they managed to get it done for a future third deal uh, with pretty much the only cost of really giving up is salary cap space, but they've been able to smooth that contract out. I think they've signed him for an extra couple of years, pushed a few hundred grand into later years of that contract. They made it work and they've landed probably a best 22 player. And on top of that, pick seven, and then on top of that, two former first-round draft picks at the end of their first contract requested trades to Geelong in Ollie Henry and Tanner Braun. They're also going to have pick seven this year, like I said, which means they pick before West Coast, uh, as I keep mentioning. But there's uh, something funny and ironic about that, considering the polar opposites the two teams were on this year. Uh, I think arguably they're the biggest winners ever to have pick seven, have their first round pick next year still intact and add three long-term, potentially best 22 players as well. They've done very well. Next, you've got the Brisbane Lions. Again, a team we've talked about heaps on this channel in particular. They brought in Josh Dunkley, Jack Gunston, a whole range of second round picks to match bids. And in terms of what they lost, it was basically Dan McStay is a free agent. They lost Tom Berry to the Gold Coast Suns, their first round of this year, as well as their first round of next year. So to, to really simplify it, what they set out to do this trade period was to land Josh Dunkley and compile enough picks to match bids on Will Ashcroft, who's the likely number one draft pick, and Jasper Fletcher, who's probably going to go around the pick 20 mark. They did all of that. They absolutely smashed it. And on top of that, they did lose Dan McStay as a free agent, but then they traded Jack Gunston in for cheap. So they've pretty much ticked every possible box this offseason. They've added Josh Dunkley, a best 22 player, a very, very good player. Uh, their likely number one draft pick, probably an early second round draft pick in Jasper Fletcher is pretty much a formality now. And they get Jack Gunston as a uh, as a third tall forward now with Danaher, Hipwood and Gunston in that forward line. They're looking dangerous. So they achieved everything they wanted to this offseason. They also held on to Dev Robertson. There was a bit of talk about him making way so that they could sort of accommodate the rest of these picks. They held on to him. They got all their dobs done. That's an A-plus trade period. We'll now talk about the Port Adelaide Football Club, who brought in Jason Horn Francis, Junior Rioli, uh, pick 33, as well as some future picks tied to Collingwood and North Melbourne. They lost Carl Amon as a free agent to the Hawthorne Footy Club. They gave away pick eight and a future first and some other picks as well. So first of all, the, the primary piece of this trade period was securing Jason Horn Francis. They got him at a very reasonable price, considering he's the number one draft pick last year and contracted essentially two first round picks 
this year and next for the number one draft pick last year. I think considering, you know, many people say he's a generational talent, obviously didn't quite hit his straps in his first year, understandable. You can't ignore the high potential talent that is Horn Francis. So they got their man and they didn't really pay through the nose to get him either. They got Junior Rioli for a future second and a future third and some sort of other upgrade. Again, a very reasonable price for a best 22 player who are offering 500 grand a year. Yes, there's some circumstantial stuff going on with Rioli, which uh, brought down his price a little bit. But when you consider, I reckon genuinely, one thing that actually that gets lost about this Rioli negotiation is, you know, th there's so many mitigating factors here, but he's an absolute gun and they're going to love him by the middle of next year. I've said that already. So that's another very good piece of business for Port Adelaide. They've improved both in the short term by getting Rioli in and in the longer term, obviously, with Jason Hall Francis. He's probably 19 years old, maybe 20 by now. They did trade away two firsts, but when you look at their recent drafting history, they've actually taken seven first rounders in the previous four drafts, if I'm not mistaken. So that's Josh Sin, Lockie Jones, Georgie Artis, Miles Bergman, Butters, Rosie, and Dersma all in the same year. Seven first rounders in four years. They can afford to take two years off. And when you consider Horn Francis himself is, is basically a first rounder considering the number one draft pick. They haven't exactly sold their future away to get these guys in. Yes, they lost Carl Amon, a best 22 player, but still I'd say a net positive and Port Adelaide are winners. The fourth winner would be Richmond. Obviously, I've talked about them already on this channel. That They secured Jacob Hopper and Tim Taranto and uh, basically sold, you know, two years worth of draft picks to get them. But considering where their list is at, they're really priming, obviously, to go for another premiership tilt this year. It was a fairly simple exchange. Traded two firsts and two seconds to get these guys in. These guys are A-grade potential, I would say. Taranto has been very, very good. Uh, I think he was the best and fairest a couple of years ago at GWS. They have the potential to be A-grade or at least B+. Plus for them. Their midfield was a weakness going into this year, but their starting midfield now is going to have Prestia, Taranto, Hopper, supported by guys like Dusty Martin, Shy Bolton, Trent Cochin, uh, and suddenly it's just a very deep and competitive midfield. So they spent big to get them, but I think Richmond will be backing themselves in from next year with a midfield that is as strong as it is on paper. I've got another winner for you. I think I might have misled you. There's actually five winners on this list. So maybe it's 12 teams I'm talking about. Can't be bothered doing the math. But either way, I'm going to add Collingwood as a winner in this trade period. It's a little bit hard to read exactly how much this is going to benefit them. But, you know, when you add Tom Mitchell, Billy Frampton, Dan McStay, Bobby Hill, as well as picks 25 and 27 in the draft, that's uh, that's one of the most busy and productive trade periods going around, to be honest. They've lost Brody Grundy, a player that was on the outer. Obviously, they weren't committed to keeping him, wasn't a required player, weren't getting that much out of him over the last few years. They lost Ollie Henry, which is a blow, but they've kept intact uh, three top 30 picks this year, and they're also going to hold their first rounder next year. So it's a balance of not selling the farm in terms of draft picks and also improving their best 22. They got their mainstay key forward in mixed day. That was not an intended pun. And getting Tom Mitchell and Bobby Hill into their midfield and forward line as well. Again, that's just strengthening what is already a very good best 22, a team that uh, narrowly missed out on making the grand final this year. Recruited Frampton as a key defender. Uh, it's too far early for me to call on how productive that's going to be. But losing Henry for 20 25 is definitely a little bit of a blow. Unfortunately, he just wanted to go. There was no real chance of retaining him. Pick 25 for a former pick 17. It's not a bad deal on paper. Overall, in summary, improved their best 22, had some structural wins getting a key forward onto the list, and they hold a pretty strong draft position as well. So well done, Collingwood. Then the first losers this video of the Gold Coast Suns, and I don't really need to make a strong case as to why that is. We talked about the Jack Bowes deal. So they lost pick seven and Jack Bowes, admittedly getting some salary cap space, but for only a third rounder coming back the other way in next year's draft, that in itself is one of the worst trades I've ever seen. What they did do was recruit Ben Long and Tom Berry, a couple of role players. Ben Long should come straight into that 22. Tom Berry is probably a little bit more questionable, but obviously they're hopeful he can make it as a pressure forward. The other thing they did was push all their second round draft picks into next year's draft because they've got some academy uh, players to match bids for next year and don't want to draft too heavy this year. So from a strategic point of view, they tick that box. Although I think in terms of what they lost out of their best 22, we haven't even mentioned Isaac Rankin, uh, who they've put four years in development into, former pick two or three, I think it was pick three. They get pick five and a bit of change for him back. Uh, although ultimately, while that's not an unfair return to lose another player they've put four years of de development into, uh, that's definitely a blow for the Gold Coast Suns, considering where they're at. Overall, they've lost quality out of their best 22. They gave away pick seven for free. Probably only going to have one or two live picks in this year's draft. Admittedly, one of them is pick five. 
I think the Gold Coast are paying for several years of bad management with this trade period, and uh, I'm intrigued to see how bad it gets for them in 12 months' time. Then there's GW West, who obviously lost Tim Taranto, Jacob Hopper, Tanner Braun, and Bobby Hill. So again, the expansion side's proving to be uh, feeder cubs for the rest of the competition. They landed a Melbourne fringe player in Toby Bedford, and admittedly have done really well getting some really high draft picks. They landed the number one draft pick. I think this is the first time pick one has been traded since 2001 in Luke Hodge uh, from Fremantle. So they do hold four picks in the top 20 of this year's draft. One, 15, 18, 19. They also hold 31, and they hold Richmond's future first round pick. But I think considering where GWS is at and their history of retaining players, I think we can all say there's a lack of confidence that they're going to turn these four top 20 picks and pick one into a strong team in a few years because they're probably just going to lose half of them anyway. The players that they lost, three of them were former first round draft picks and Bobby Hill would have been close to that first round. I think he might have been in the 20s. So either way, they're just bleeding talent and uh, it's a question of when is it going to stop? I've put the Bulldogs as a slight loser. They're not big losers, nowhere near as uh, big on the scale as the two expansion clubs. But to summarize what they did, they got Liam Jones as an unrestricted free agent. They got Rory Lobb in the end from Fremantle and they hold pick 21 from Brisbane and Brisbane's first and second round picks next year. What they lost, unfortunately, was Josh Dunkley, a uh, player in the prime whose career in a side that is uh, well, considering themselves for uh, contention for a flag. Lockie Hunter also left. They lost Shaki and Zane Cordy, a little bit less consequential. They're not big losers, like I said, but I don't know if they've been massively compensated for the for the short-term loss that they've incurred. They were unlucky in a sense that Dunkley nominated Brisbane. He's out of contract and they had to accept pretty much the best offer that, that Brisbane could possibly generate. That being said, I still think they've lost more than they've gained this offseason. Jones and Lobb are pretty good ins in the sense that they were of structural need. They wanted uh, some tall timber up front and down back as well. So those were good in isolation. But to lose McRae and Dunkley out of that midfield and be compensated with some reasonable draft picks, it must be said. But none of them in the top 10. Nothing really juicy to get excited about. So while they probably did all they could this offseason, overall, I don't think they're better off it. And that's why, for me, they're slight losers. I'm also going to throw North Melbourne into the mix of a uh, being one of the losers this trade period. I don't think that's too controversial. They lost Horn Francis. Uh, they traded away pick one. They've also traded some future picks uh, for established players. Those established players being Griffin Logue, Darcy Tucker, and uh, they've also gained Port Adelaide's future first round pick as well. So that's a bit of a mess. So let's simplify it a little bit. Their strategy was to mature the list. They were linked to about five established players that end up coming away with just two of them, Griffin Logue and Darcy Tucker. Griffin Logue, I think, is a really good acquisition for them. Darcy Tucker is a bit more speculative as to whether he's actually going to make it at AFL level. Whatever way you slice it, Horn Francis bowing out after just one year on the job, uh, that's a massive blow, to be honest, and indicative of the crisis that they currently find themselves in. Sure, you could argue that it was better for them to trade him this year rather than wait a year, and they probably do agree with that. But overall, we're assessing on net in versus net out. Him him leaving is a blow in terms of morale as much as it is talent. When I say morale, I'm sure the players and, and fans probably think, you know, let's get rid of a player that doesn't want to be here anyway. So it might have actually been negative on morale to keep him. But I mean, big picture, number one draft pick leaves after one year. It's not exactly a PR win, is it? But when you simplify the deals that they really got done, you, they got pick two in a future first for Jason Horn Francis, that future first being tied to Port Adelaide. And then they've traded down one to three in this year's draft. So if you isolate two in a future first for Horn Francis, probably a fair deal. But they've slid down to three in this year's draft in addition to uh, that pick two as well. So overall, I don't know if they've extracted great value out of this trade period. Had they really cashed in and gotten some really juicy offers for Horn Francis, it might have been considered a bit of a win, if anything, but overall, it's just not great at North Melbourne. So then I'll quickly rattle through three teams that were active this trade period that I found it really hard to sort of categorize as winners or losers. I'll talk about Fremantle in this. They've brought in Luke Jackson, Jago O'Meara, Josh Corbett, uh, and then there's a whole host of future round picks tied to North Melbourne. They lost Lloyd Meek, Rory Lobb, Blake Akers, Griffin Logue, Darcy Tucker, and their two firsts this year and next year. The only reason I categorize it as hard to say it's just there's a lot going out for a lot coming in they landed Luke Jackson and you have to say this trade period success or failure really hinges on how he projects as a player I think going after Jackson was the right move he's potentially a generational talent he's a dynamic player and he's nowhere near his prime as well so it's not as though they've really sold their future in that sense in isolation getting him for two first round picks considering they're probably going to be later first round picks that is probably a reasonable result too 
But they do lose five players to trade this offseason as well. Meek and Tucker are probably less consequential uh, considering their list needs. But Lobb, Akers, and Luke have been important players at various points over the last couple of years. They did get O'Meara to mitigate that experience loss, but then you also factor in David Mundy's retired as well. It could be a bit of a short-term blip this trade period for them. There's a, there's a bit of a depth that's gone out. Do they strengthen immediately next year? I'm not too sure. There's a lot of natural progression from a lot of young players on that list, so maybe they do. But let's be real, it really hinges on how well Luke Jackson performs at the highest level now. Hawthorne, I've got as another team that's hard to read. Their offseason consisted of Carl Amon in. They got Lloyd Meek. They got Cooper Stevens, as well as some you know later picks coming in in both this year's draft and next. They lost Jack Gunson, Tom Mitchell, Jager O'Meara, and their future fourth. And those established best 22 players with a lot of experience, they didn't really get a lot back in terms of draft capital, which you'd expect. Now, in terms of their best 22, Hawthorne have lost a whole heap of quality here. I don't think you can deny that. When you There's a former Brownlow medalist in there. Jager O'Meara is a solid player. Jack Gunston has been a gun for as long as I can remember. Uh, but the only reason I don't peg them as a genuine loser here is because it appeared to be very, very deliberate. You contrast that with other teams bleeding experienced players. The difference here is that Hawthorne are actively pushing them out. Now, there's a cynical theory out here, and I'm pretty open to it, that Hawthorne are looking at next year's draft. There's a generational talent called Harley Reid, uh, likely to go number one, but in general, the depth is a lot stronger. They're looking at that draft and setting themselves up for maybe a year of pain, and they get another high draft pick to really finish off this rebuild. Getting Amon in is a bit of an outlier. It kind of contradicts uh, the rest of that. I think he's 26, so kind of in the prime of his career, you'd have to say, uh, but it's offset by the loss of those other midfielders. And you look at their starting midfield ne next year, it's got Warple, War Newcomb, Amon, McGuinness, Morrison, Moore, other names I'm probably forgetting. And while there's a lot of talent there, it's hard to make a case that that midfield is going to be winning games as early as next year. So Hawthorne gone here with a clear strategy to get younger, expose some of this uh, this young talent they've got on their list. And I think it could set them up for some short-term pain, but it's not a clear loss just yet. Finally, we'll talk about Melbourne, uh, who were very active in this trade period again. They brought in Brody Grundy, Lockie Hunter, Josh Shackey, and uh, pick 13 this year, as well as a few future first and uh, and Fremantle's future second actually I'm reading here what they lost was Luke Jackson obviously Sam Wiedemann a former top 10 pick Jaden Hunt was signed as an unrestricted free agent and Toby Bedford went to GWS so that's a former pick three and a former pick nine walking out on the club uh, obviously Luke Jackson is a fair bit different to Wiedemann in the fact that uh, he's you know a lot more sure of making his talent. And that one is certainly considered a big blow, but they did cover it in the short term with Brody Grundy and now Gorn and Grundy. That looks like probably the most uh, formidable ruck duo in the competition now. Jackson is a massive loss, probably in terms of the medium to long term. Obviously, you know, in terms of competing for a premiership over the next couple of years, Grundy probably comes in to offset that loss. But when you consider just actual talent and potential, losing Luke Jackson is considered one of the most talented young tallers in the league, if not the most. To lose Jackson and not even hold a top 10 pick in this year's draft, I wouldn't say that is the most satisfying compensation for him, although they did get two firsts and a future second as well. I wouldn't say they're big losers just yet because they are smack bang in the middle of contention. And it's really about the next one to three years for Melbourne and getting that right. And so Luke Jackson, while they already contributed to a premiership, they got Grundy in and suddenly their ruck duo, you know, there's no real gaping hole there, is there? And it's certainly not a winning trade period for them because, you know, whether they could have stopped Luke Jackson walking out or not, the loss of him over the next five to 10 years is probably something they're going to feel for a few years to come. Anyway, guys, that is my crack at talking about, uh, it ended up being 12 teams in the competition who, uh, you know, were worth talking about this trade period. So I think we had uh, five winners, four losers and three teams that uh, it's hard to get a read on and the other six probably just didn't do enough for me to really bother talking about in this video. But anyway guys as always let me know what you agree with and disagree with in this video. Let me know in the comments section subscribe to the channel if you're new and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.